In the 21st century, I am a guardian of the King family legacy. I'm the first in my generation of children and grandchildren to Martin Luther King Sr. and Alberta Williams King, to Christine King Ferris, the do their daughter, Martin Luther King Jr., the son, and then my dad, A.D. King. And so they had children, and I'm the first of that generation. And my particular testimony, my mother loves to share the testimony, and I, I wish she were here to share it with you as well. But uh, as she gives the account, she was in the 10th grade. My dad, A.D., saw her, and he said, oh, that's my wife, prettiest woman I've ever seen, little girl, little 10th grader. And so he began to court her and pursue her. And she would laugh and say, I wasn't even thinking about him. I, somebody else, I had caught the eye of somebody else, but daddy pursued. That was his lady. And so they courted for two years. Courting means they had no intimacy. They just courted. They went out to chaperone dates and activities, and she was his delight, and he was her champion. In 1950, her mother says, Big Mama Bessie, my grandmother, she says, well, you're engaged now, because he asked her to marry him. He had given her a six, sweet 16 birthday party, and then the next year went, and then he knew that that was who he wanted to marry. And so her mother says, well, you're such a good girl, and you're going to marry A.D. one day when you finish college, and that's going to be great, so you can go on a date. There's a difference between courting, and that's supervised or out in activities with no intimacy sexually whatever, whatsoever. And then a date is really for more so for married people because sexual intimacy and holy matrimony goes with that. So mother had been protected from that. Her mother decided since she was engaged to daddy, she could go on a date. She says, Nene, just make sure he wears a rain hat. So mom said, okay. So they went out on a date, not courting, and I showed up on the date. That's the way I like to explain it. There was intimacy. And so at the end of the date, mother says, A.D., why did mama say you needed a rain hat? It's not raining. So daddy laughs and he reaches and gets his wallet. In those days, boys had very little, and young men had little need for condoms. They called them rubbers, but the girls were protected. They never needed them. They had one. It could be five years old. They carried around, and they'd be at the party in the corner laughing. You got yours, man? Yeah, I got mine. Yeah, you see? But they never opened them. They didn't need them. So he pulled out one, and he showed it to my mother, and he said, girl, this is a rubber, but don't worry about that. You're my wife, we're gonna be fine. So very soon, mother realized that something was different. She felt her body was different and all of that. In those days, the way that you found out whether you were pregnant or not, you took a rabbit test. A rabbit test was a very archaic procedure. They took a live rabbit, took uh, fluid or urine from the, the girl or the woman, injected it into the rabbit, if the rabbit died, she was pregnant. Now that's a rabbit test, it was a real procedure. So her mother took her and they were gonna have a rabbit test, but turns out she really was pregnant. And so she went on to school and her mother was kinda quiet for a while. And mother came home with a flyer from the Birth Control League. It was right in transition, becoming Planned Parenthood. And so the flyer said, women are not chattel. A woman has the right to choose what she does with her body. We've got procedures for mysterious female ailments. Come and see us. At the same time, the Birth Control League had been in cooperation with the Tuskegee Project, where they had given many Negro men syphilis and didn't treat it to see what would happen. They had a project called the Negro Project, where they were experimenting with birth control and they were giving the Negro men and women free or low-cost vasectomies and tubal ligations, tying tubes. And their ex explanation was, you want to be a credit to your race. You shouldn't have so many children. It's not necessary. And so they were doing all of these experiments, and so their latest was procedures for mysterious female ailments. Those were DNCs. So if a lady had something wrong and she wasn't quite sure, but her stomach was not feeling comfortable, she would go and get this procedure for mysterious female ailment. And anything that was in her reproductive system would be removed and examined to see what the problem was. In other words, abortion was illegal. You could not get an abortion at the doctor's office, 
But you didn't have to go in a back alley with a coat hanger. You just go to the doctor and tell him you had a stomach ache. If he was in league or she was in league with Planned Parenthood, they knew exactly what to do. So mother wanted a procedure for a mysterious female ailment. Her mother said, this doesn't look right. Let's talk to our pastor. Their pastor happened to be Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. Granddaddy says, Nene, that was her nickname, Naomi King, they're lying to you. That's not a mysterious female ailment, that's an abortion. And you can't do this, this is my granddaughter. I saw her in a dream three years ago. She has bright skin and bright red hair, and she is gonna bless many people. I was born looking exactly like he said, and I was considered to be a miracle. The family concealed the early pregnancy. Mom and dad were married. Uh, they concealed everything else. The only thing they always talked about was, your granddaddy saw you before you were born. And so I was the apple of his eye, the first of the generation. Uh, Mom and dad were married before I was born. And they had five children, and then Uncle ML and Aunt Coretta married and had four children, and Aunt Christine married and had two. So I'm the first of that generation. So we were, as children, brought up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, Sunday school, church, all the famous sermons of Martin Luther King Jr. I heard many of them when he was preaching in Atlanta as co-pastor with his dad. My dad, Reverend A.D. King, and he were called the Sons of Thunder for their preaching style and their work in the Civil Rights Movement. I was trained by my daddy, my first march, the Children's March in 1963, after our home in Birmingham, Alabama, had been bombed in May, the night before Mother's Day. And Daddy, I remember Daddy standing, the house was bombed. He gets us all out of the house safely. The people are out there, black power, black power. Not quite Black Lives Matter of the 21st century, but black power. And they wanted to riot, and they were trying to turn the cars over and throw rocks at the police and all this. And Daddy says, look, my family and I are okay. I'd rather you go home and pray, we're fine. If you need to hit somebody, hit me, but no, go home and pray. So he dispelled the violence, called for peace, prayed for the Lord to come in, and I can remember those days. So historically, I was brought up to value life and to also value peace, to obey and love God. And so that's part of the King family legacy uh, that gave me birth and brought me to the 21st century, where today I speak out not just for civil rights based upon us being one race, Acts 1726, and not separate races, one blood, one race, Acts 1726, God made all people, but to value life from the womb until the tomb, from conception until natural birth. And so how we became so far away from that to a legacy now from Martin Luther King saying, Martin Luther King Jr. saying, we must learn to live together as brothers, and I added sisters in this century, or perish as fools. And so that means every human being. And if someone's not allowed to be born, none of the other issues would ever matter. And so our legacy in the King family is agape love, faith, hope, and love, the greatest being love. And if we can love, there's no problem that cannot be resolved.